Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Charlie. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. I survived today, this March 22nd of 1985, and I am truly grateful for that. It's the most important thing, one of the most important things that's ever happened in my life. I, uh, we're real excited to be here. I uh, went through a, a series of airplane flights to get here. I, uh, had that one from uh, Tupelo, Mississippi over here was uh, 19 minutes. 19 minutes. Uh, <laughs> That's just up and down, and I'll, I'll get to uh, my level of nervousness in that later in the story. But I, uh, it was uh, yeah, that's the shortest flight I've ever been on, I believe. It, well, no, yeah, that's even shorter than the one I'll tell you about here in about 40 minutes. But I, uh, I'm, I'm real happy to be here today. Uh, Randy and Landon have been doing a good job taking care of us. I want to thank everybody on the committee and and uh, you know that had anything to do with getting us here. Some of you folks we met before and. You know, just anybody that had anything to do with putting this thing on, we're real grateful for it. And we're just, uh, you know, and if you, if you've been around AA for a while, you know that, that it takes a lot of people do a lot of work to get something like this to come together. And, you know, and if it's like the group that I come from, there's also a lot of people didn't do a darn thing. But, <laughs> but they have a lot of ideas about how it could have been done just a little bit better. You know, you know, so, so, so. For them, we got a, a position on the committee for next year. You know, I, uh, I'm here. Uh, I, uh, I got my wife Katie with me. I, uh, Katie is, uh, well, she's sober five months longer than I am, and she thinks it's a really big deal. I, you know, uh, uh, stand up, and say hi, to everybody, Katie. I just, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I like to think of myself as some of her best work. I. Uh, <laughs> And boy, that is not kidding. I mean, you know, they, but, you know, most people don't really understand the size of the job she had. Uh, you know, I hope to talk about some of that, you know, as we go along. But it's, it's really fun because, I mean, she's going to talk Sunday morning and, and I'm telling you, she is a, a powerhouse. She's sometimes, uh, sometimes she's kind of like getting a drink from a fire hose, but, uh, you know, you know, so, <laughs> my, some, you know, you get, you get a little more than you were hoping for sometimes, you know, one of my, one of my sponsees said, boy, when you read inventory with Katie, it's like she digs and then she digs a little deeper and then you dig a little deeper. And, but anyway, we're going to, we're, we're just real excited about everything that's going to go on this weekend. I, uh, I show up here in a coat and tie for, uh, because uh, I have a lot of respect for the tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, uh, in my sponsorship lineage, it was, it was okay if you didn't want to wear a coat and tie. You just, and you still had to do it, but uh, if you wanted if you wanted to do it under protest, that was just fine, you know. But I, I got to tell you, I don't know what it looks like from where you're sitting, but my, the bulk of my experience in a coat and tie before I got to this fellowship, I had a very simple job. All I had to do was stand there, and when it came my turn, I'd say, "No contest, Your Honor." <laughs> you know, <I> mean, <laughs> that's about it. So you know. I'm not sure what we'll talk about tonight, but you know, when I, we talk about talking from our own experience, and, I, and that's one of the things that's, that I really like about AI, and, I, and I, I got a little joke I like to tell to kind of just get warmed up and get some of the nervous off I'm in. Some of you, uh, may have heard this joke before. A couple of you probably heard me tell it before, but it's a good joke, and I like the way I tell it, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it again. But it's about this old guy, he's driving along this old country road, and he sees a sign on the on the fence post and it says talking dog for sale. And he can't stand it. You know, he stops the car and he goes up to the barn and he, or the farmhouse and he says, So you got a talking dog for sale? And the guy goes, Yeah, he's around back. And he walks around back and there's this red hound dog laying there and he and he, he looks at the dog and he says, So so you can talk? And the dog says, Well, I certainly can. And he goes, Good grief, how did that happen? And he said, Well, when I was young I started picking up some of the language from some of the kids around me and stuff, and as I got older I started getting more advanced and developed some of the nuances of the language and picking up slang terms and that sort of thing. And he said, You know, it's it's just made for an amazing career for me. He said, I had a I had a nineteen year career in the Drug Enforcement Administration. I was I was able to infiltrate some situations that no human agent would have ever been able to get into. And he said, but, you know, and, and I've, I've eaten in some of the finest restaurants in the world. I've stayed in some of the finest hotels. But really more interesting than all that, some of my pups 
have started developing uh, foreign language skills and, and have become international diplomats. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got two pups that are in the United Nations right now. And uh, he says, it's just been a fascinating life. And the guy says, boy, it has really been a treat talking to you. I, you know, and he goes back around front where that old farmer's sitting there whittling. And he goes, how much do you want a dog for a dog like that? And the guy goes, I don't know, 30 bucks? And he goes, why would you sell a fantastic dog like that for 30 bucks? And the guy goes, oh, none of that crap he told you is true. (laughs) It's kind of like that around here. It doesn't matter how good the story is if it's not my experience, you know, so... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll on in, I'm gonna roll on into it, cause I got a lot of ground to cover tonight. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and so does my mother. And, uh, my, my 89 year old mother is real fond of you guys. I, uh, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My, my, my home group now, I, I should have said this at the beginning. My, uh, my home group is the primary purpose group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Austin, Texas. It's a big book study meeting. We meet on Tuesday nights at 7.30. If you ever find yourself in Austin, we'd love to see you. We think it's a, an amazing meeting. We, we study the big book line by line, week after week, and uh, it's just a lot more fun than it sounds like. I, uh, um, we, we usually run about 175 people on a Tuesday night studying the big book. It's, 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 it's phenomenal. I mean, I had a buddy of mine down from Indianapolis the other day. He said, we don't have a meeting of any kind in Indianapolis of this size. I mean, and you can feel the, the energy in the room of people that are fired up. You know, we're not studying the book just to have a quick answer, you know, for somebody. It's, it's about getting clarity on what the book is saying having that experience and then carrying that message out to other people. It's the, it's the most electric thing I've ever been involved in. And My sponsor uh, was Mark Houston. Uh, most recently he passed with some of you. I don't know if any of you have ever heard Mark Houston, but do yourself a favor and try to get a hold of a CD of his. And, and, uh, cause he, he changed our world, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. But I, I And before that it was Jim F., and right now it's Myers R., and, and uh, here you're going to have uh, the evil twin Chris R. here next year. So uh, I, I wish I could be here for that. Um, I come from a pretty normal family. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. We live in Austin, Texas now. I like to make that real clear because sometimes if I'm not careful, it'll sound like we still live in in Dallas, and and, and we don't. But I I grew up in in Dallas in a pretty normal family, you know. I mean, I don't don't know exactly what normal is, but, I mean, or or what dysfunctional is or what a a functional family is, but I can say this much. Everything's pretty good in our house. I mean, nobody was knocking each other around. Nobody was, there wasn't any drinking. I grew up in a Baptist household there in Dallas, and I mean, uh, there was no drinking going on in our house, you know, and, uh, it turns out the family was rampant with alcoholism, but not in our little nuclear family, but, um, I, the reason I say pretty normal families, I've heard enough fifth steps over the years to know that a lot of people had it just one heck of a lot worse than I had it growing up. I, I had a pretty decent uh, growing up. I grew up with a sister who's five and a half years older than I am and uh, and kind of perfect, you know. Um, and um, my mother was a first grade school teacher for 42 years. And I was darn well prepared for the first grade. I um, I got to tell you, I I kind of rocked it, you know. I mean, <laughs> uh, but I mean, but my sister was all everything, you know. I mean, she was National Honor Society first chair flautist, uh, drum majorette, you name it, you know. And then here's this thuggish little brother, you know, that uh, coming along. But but I grew up under the burden of potential. Anybody else grew up under the burden of potential? I mean, my whole life growing up, I, my mother would always say, you know. Why can't you live up to your potential? You know, why can't you be more like Charles Malier across the street? You know, I mean, if you could, just, and, I, and I'm like, gosh, thanks, Mom. Uh, it's flattering, but uh, I'm really not holding back that much, you know. <laughs> but, but I'm flattered you think so. But, but, you know, I mean, and my sister was a tough act to follow, and I don't know what it was, but. I know all the stuff in that little church that they were saying not to do, I couldn't wait to do. I mean, you know, every, everything they were talking about just sounded so appealing to me. And, and I don't know what caused my alcoholism. Uh, I know none of that did. 
Um, none of the stuff that happened to me caused my alcoholism. None of the stuff that didn't happen to me caused my alcoholism. I'm, 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 a, I'm, I'm a big believer in singleness of purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I just say a little bit about it. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is about alcoholics working with alcoholics. We don't try to be all things to all people. We're about alcoholics working with alcoholics. And, you know, I think a lot of times we, we, we spend a lot of time when you get here, I know I did. I spent some time trying to figure out why I was alcoholic. You know, anybody else that? You know, what happened to me? What is it made me alcoholic? And I've come to believe it doesn't really matter. It's kind of like if you're out hiking, you know, in the woods and you come across a grizzly bear that's getting ready to pounce on you. It doesn't really matter how he got there. You know, <laughs> it's like we we got to deal with it. You know, and and and. I, I've come to believe I didn't start drinking until I was 16 years old. Uh, I drank a little bit before that. I mean, I got drunk a few times when I was 13, 14. I don't have a lot of clear memories of it, but I didn't really start hitting it pretty hard till I was about 16 years old. And you know, I used to think that was really young to start drinking. You know, and good grief, now it's not even young to stop. You know, I mean, it's like you got people, you know, coming in. You know, and, and I'm not busting on anybody. I have much love for young people and Alcoholics Anonymous, but for me, I started drinking when I was 16 years old. And, and I don't, I don't know at what point I crossed the line, but um, you know, on page 30 in our book, the founders are saying we learned that. We had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. It says this is the first step in, in recovery. And there's a lot going on in that sentence. First of all, if I'm going to fully concede to my innermost self that I'm alcoholic, one, I best know what it means to be alcoholic. Right? And there's a big difference between fully conceding to my innermost self and walking around saying I'm an alcoholic. I'd been walking around saying I was an alcoholic for a long time before I got to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I was not one of these guys that, uh, you hear people saying, you know, I, I told my family that I went to AA and they said, really? I didn't even know you had a problem. And you're like, that was not my experience. You know, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't anybody, you know, everybody was like, oh, thank God. You know, I, you know, and, and you know, I will say that one thing about that potential. Twelve years of heavy drinking and, and use of outside issues um, can significantly lower people's expectations of you. You know, I mean, by the time I was 28, they were like, oh, for God's sake, just get a job. You know, I mean, don't, we're not worried about a career anymore or a, or a position or education. Just get off the couch, for God's sake. You know, and, you know, and, but... What is it that makes me alcoholic? It's two things. I got two things that make me alcoholic. I've said I've said this a lot that I've only got two problems with alcoholics. I mean, with alcohol that make me an alcoholic. One happens to me when I drink it. The other one happens to me when I don't drink it. Other than that, I really don't have much of a problem with alcohol. Just, it just, <laughs> I just struggle with it when I'm drinking it or when I'm not drinking it. You know, and that's what we mean by alcoholism in the book. I'm a big book guy, and all this is right here is a large print copy of the first edition, I mean, I mean, the fourth edition of the big book that my sponsor got hold of and, and pulled the stories out of the back and leather bound it and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm a big book guy. I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, it, and the book doesn't wait long to start making promises to a drunk like me. Right there on the title page, it says how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. Heck, if you show up here like I did, knowing you got alcoholism, and there's a little book that'll tell me how they, these people recovered from it. That's pretty good news. Well, what is it that makes me alcoholic? And the book does a beautiful job of describing it in the doctor's opinion in the first 43 pages of the book. But it talks about that I got two problems with alcohol. One happens to me when I drink it, and that's the physical reaction, the physical aspect of alcoholism that makes me different from my sister. My sister is not alcoholic. She never will be. She doesn't, she doesn't, you know, I can't pour enough vodka in her to make her alcoholic. I, I couldn't, you know, I mean, I could, we could pour enough vodka in her to get her drunk, but, and we could put her behind the wheel of a car and she could get a DWI. In fact, you'd probably admit that there could be somebody sitting in jail this evening that went to a party last night, drank a little too much, got a DWI on the way home, but they're not alcoholic. Right? Would you agree that that's possible? 
Well, if you can get a DWI without being an alcoholic, then getting DWIs and going to jail and that kind of stuff doesn't make me alcoholic because that's that's just what happens to, to people that drink a lot. But what makes me alcoholic are these two things that the book talks about. And it talks about this physical craving. It says this physical reaction that doesn't happen to normal folks. It only happens about 10% of the population. Only, only about 10% of the population even has the capacity to become alcoholic. Right, you know, and it's because of this what the book calls this strange reaction to, and they call it the phenomenon of craving. And when I drink, something happens that ain't regular. It, it triggers in me a craving for more booze. And I didn't know that when I got here. I didn't. I, I mean, you know, I didn't. You know, I never knew that I had triggered the phenomenon of craving when I take that first drink. In fact, I just thought I changed my mind. Right? You ever, you ever go in, you know, I'm just going to have a couple, right? We're not going to do like we did last time, you know, and I'm definitely not drinking with those guys again, you know. I'm just, I'm just going to have a couple. And I'd get in there and I'd have a couple of drinks. I'd change my mind, you know. And it's like, I, I believe I'm going to stay here, boys. You go, you know, you ever go with the guys after work and they go, hey, we're going to go have a couple of drinks after work. You want to go? And you're like, well, yes, I do. I, I, I believe I. And then you get there and you know what they do? They have a couple of drinks. It's the darnest thing I've ever seen, you know. I mean, they'll, and then you know they'll go. Uh, listen, dude, uh, my wife's—I got to go. My wife's making spaghetti at the house. And I told her I'd be home for dinner, and I'm, I'm the one sitting there going, "Really? <laughs> spaghetti, you say? Okay. I believe I'll stay here. I've, you know, and, you know. And the book does a, a whole lot of description about this craving and what happens to it. It even says that there have been many situations that arise out of the phenomenon of craving that cause men to make the ultimate sacrifice rather than continue to fight. And that ultra, ultimate sacrifice is what we see around here when you see people, you know, suck on the wrong end of a shotgun and, and that sort of thing. When, you know, this powerlessness over the physical piece of it, it's a huge problem. It's not my biggest problem. Because if my biggest problem was what happens when I drink vodka, my answer would be what? Don't drink vodka, right? You know how hard would that be? But just just think about it. Are there some new people here tonight? How many people here have less than six months? Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Because believe me, I spent a good deal of time sitting around the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, raising my hand, saying, my name's Charlie, I'm an alcoholic, and I had no idea what it meant. I figured if there is such a thing as an alcoholic, I'm, I must be one, because I didn't know anybody that drank more than I did. I mean, I always say that the, the shortest version of my drinking story is that the guys that I drank with thought that I did too many outside issues. And and the guys that I did outside issues with were shocked by my drinking, you know. So everybody I knew thought that I was getting a little too loaded, you know. I mean, I always related to there was a band that got sober. The whole band got sober by the time I did. And I loved the quote. They said they knew they were they were crossing the line when the guys in Motley Crue told them, you know, you guys need to back it down just a little bit. You know, I mean, <laughs> when you got these death metal groups telling you, man, you guys got to slow it down some, you know, I mean. But anyway, let's keep rolling. Because what happens is the, the second piece of this thing, and I didn't think about it for a long time, is that, that every time I ever took that first drink of alcohol, the one that triggers the craving, the one that sends me off on another run, the craziest decision that I can make in my life, the decision to try to take another run at this deal, every time I ever took that first drink, I was stone cold sober. Huh? I can't blame the first drink on being drunk. I make that decision sober because of what happens to me when I don't drink alcohol. When I don't drink, I, after a while it gets pretty bad. You know, when I don't drink, my problems don't go away. If if your problems go away when you stop drinking, it's it's a different thing than alcoholism. For me, when I'd stop drinking, it seemed like somebody turned the heat up on me. You know, and you know, Harry Tebow wrote a paper one time called The Ego Factors and Surrender in Alcoholism. It was brilliant. There was a line in there where he said, The recuperative powers of the alcoholic ego are astounding. You know, and what he means is, you know, I'm the guy that, you know, I mean, think about that day when you were calling detox to see if they had a bed. Oh, God, I'll do anything, right? I'll do anything, anything, anything. You know, I can't live. Now, you give me about two weeks, and I'm going, I don't really like this place very much, you know. I don't. 
I don't like the counselors here. I don't like. I've been looking for the suggestion box and can't find it. You know, I mean, you know, I don't. You know, I you know. I mean, and it, because after a while, I get uncomfortable. You know, when I when I don't drink for a while, and the book calls it restless, irritable, and discontented. And after a while, I need some relief. And when I need relief, I can't think about what's going to happen if I drink again. When I need relief bad enough, I can't think about what happened the last time I drank. You know, on page 24, it says, At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. So the only requirement for membership, a desire to stop drinking, will get me a front row seat in any AA meeting in the world. It says right there on page 24, it won't do a darn thing to keep me sober. It says right there, the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. It says, I've lost the power of choice and drink. My so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. I am unable at certain times to bring into my consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. I'm without defense against the first drink. And that, that suffering and humiliation I can't call to mind. It doesn't matter whether it's my suffering and humiliation or my family's suffering and humiliation. I can't call it to mind when I need relief. When I, you know, so it always blows me away when we have a, a new person come in a room and they have a, you know, well, let's do a step one meeting and everybody tells their war stories and talks about all the terrible things that happened, you know, when they were drinking. Like, like we're going to scare this new guy into getting sober. You know, I mean, when you know, page 24 tells me that my stuff won't scare me enough to keep me from taking the first drink. You know, why? Why would I care what happened to Randy? You know, I mean, it's not like I'm going to be in the in the beer store one day grabbing the cooler and going, "Oh, hold on a minute. Remember what that guy said in the meeting the other day? I don't, I don't want any of that." You know, I mean, when I need relief, uh, it's coming, and I, and I always say, you know. We could talk about this a long time, but if, if you're somebody that can make up your mind to stop drinking and pull it off, you don't even belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I lost the power of choice and control somewhere along the line. And, and you know, one of the things I like to talk about, I mean, it started, because our book says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Any argument on that one? You know, I mean... <laughs> I probably still love vodka more than most people that are out there drinking it tonight. But, I mean, I, I think it's a little understated, you know, I mean, to say that I like the effect produced by alcohol. I, I like banana pudding, you know, but I love the effect produced by alcohol. The first time I got loaded, I remember thinking, oh, we're going to do this a lot, <laughs> you know. And from that moment, it moved to the center of my life, and I didn't even know it. But any, I didn't, the thing I really didn't know was that anything that interfered with me and my drinking was going to get moved out of my life. If my job got in the way of my drinking, the job's going to have to go. If a girlfriend says, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave you, I, I'd be thinking, well, honey, I don't want you to leave, and I like what we got, and I don't, you know, and I'll try to taper down, and I won't do any of that, and I won't do any of this, but in my heart, I knew if you're talking about not doing anything ever, you're probably going to have to go. You know, because that's just not available for me. And it's because somewhere along the line, you know, I mean, like I said, it was working real good early on, and then, and then it started getting a little sloppy. You know, one time I'm leaving a bar in a blackout, and uh, uh, I was a blackout drinker. I uh, um, I blacked out a lot regularly. I uh, I always drank for oblivion. And Katie was not a blackout drinker. Katie was a brownout drinker. Um, but and and it turns out she was vulnerable to things in in blackouts that. I didn't have to worry about. It. Let's just say that, you know, and, you know, because. But one night I'm leaving a bar. I had five Long Island teas, and I, uh, by the bartender's count, and I leave, and I'm and I'm in my mother's station wagon. Yeah, I wrecked every car my mother ever owned. I, uh, I should tell you that I was so poorly treated as a child that I finally ran away from home for good at the age of 28. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding either. I never went back, you know. I, uh, but. But I mean, I'm leaving in this, and I, and I ram into a car. I'm in a blackout, and what brought me out of the blackout was this impact, and I can see the fender sticking up, but we're still rolling. I drove Katie by the scene of the crime just the other day. The car's still rolling, so I keep my foot on the gas, and I get the car down and around the corner, and I grab my shoes. For some reason, my shoes were off, and, uh, and I go running back towards the bar to report the car stolen, and, uh, <laughs> 
and, and I got to tell you, this is not an extraordinary night in the life of Charlie Parker. This is just kind of the way things rolled back then. But I'm running back to this bar because I, I'm going to take anything but personal accountability for this accident. And, uh, and I run back, and as I'm running back, uh, under this line of trees over here where I'd hit the car, there's glass all on the street, and there's two cops standing out there, and they had their flashlight like this, and they're shining them, and there's glass everywhere in the street. And as I'm running with my shoes in my hand, I remember thinking, good grief, man. They got here fast. You know what I mean? Because I, I just hit them. And, uh, and so uh, the next day, uh, the police called, and they said, Mr. Parker, you're going to have to take a polygraph test in order to get your car back. And I said, why is that? He said, well, it was involved in an accident before it was reported stolen. And I said, you're kidding. And they said, no, uh, they ran into a parked police car. <laughs> and you remember those moments of clarity. I, I remember thinking, that explains how they got there so fast. <laughs> you know, because I've been a little foggy on that one, you know, but I mean... But, but, I mean, that's what I'm talking about when things started getting, started getting sloppy. But somewhere along the line, I lost the power of choice and control over alcohol. It talks about it on page 44. It says, if when you honestly want to, you can't quit entirely. Or if when drinking, you have a little control over the amount you take, probably alcoholic. And, well, the way it showed up for me, I don't know when I crossed that invisible line. I think that's why we call it an invisible line. But, but somewhere along the line, it started getting really sloppy. Because one of the things, I loved pawn shops. I love pawn shops. Where's my, where's Chad? Where's my boy Chad? He said he was a pawn star earlier. I, uh, I love the pawn shops because, was that, here he is. He, I see it. He wasn't going to put his hand up. All right. Say hello to these fine people, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love the pawn shops because I like the whole purity of the equation. You know, the thing I liked about pawn shops was that there was no shame. There was no, you know, I don't ever, there was never a pawnbroker that went, good God, man. (laughs) You know, what are you going to do with this money? You know, or, or weren't you just in here this morning? You know, or or something like that. It wasn't like that. You just take in the deer rifle and and they give you the money and you leave and you come back with the shotgun and, and, you know, and, and we drunks, we drunks make some brilliant plans. We really do. I mean, we're smart folks. I love it. Scott Redmond used to say how, you know how you always hear people say that alcoholics have a higher IQ than most people and everybody and everybody nods their head, you know, in the meetings and stuff. He goes, you know, you only hear that in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. You know, it's like, it's like the AMA is not out there going, man, did you see Charlie crash his car into that tree the other night? He is a genius, you know. In fact, I called my mother because she used to always talk about genius IQ and that sort of thing. And I told, I finally called her the other day. I said, Mom, the big book says I'm a genius. I've never seen it. I didn't see it until just a little while ago. But it says he has a, 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 a real genius for getting drunk at exactly the wrong time. And I was like, I'm a genius. You know, but <laughs> that's a little sidebar. I, I didn't mean to talk about that. But when it talks about losing the power of choice and control, we, we, we make these really solid plans. And I mean, to the point where if you took it and showed it to somebody over at the University of Alabama, they'd go, pretty solid plan. You know, I mean, and our plans work right up till they quit working, you know. And, 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 and the plan I had was that you had 90 days to get everything out of the pawn shop, you know. And I forgot a critical piece of this equation. Um, I didn't own very much stuff. So uh, I was having to pawn stuff that didn't belong to me. I, I, and that creates hard feelings in your family and, and that sort of thing. But, I mean, I had a plan. I wasn't just selling the stuff. We're going to pawn it, and we're going to get some money later, and we're going to go back and get it, you know. And, and we'd roll like that for a while, and it, and it worked really well until it didn't work, you know. And, and one night I'd pull, one day I'd pulled an insurance scan. It was enough to get everything out of the pawn shop. And... I stopped in the Spillway Pub there in East Dallas. I'm just going to have a couple of drinks because I got a lot of ground to cover. And I mean, I didn't walk in there and go, "Oh, Bobby, um, spiritual malady is on me today," or, or uh, you know, I've you know, I've had a beer on the way over here and it has triggered a phenomenon of craving. You know, that, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. But I, all I know is I came out of a five-day blackout on the edge of the bed at my mother's house. I had a lot of blackouts, but I didn't have many of those. I mean, this was five days of nothing, and I have one memory from that five days. 
And I had $8 in my pocket, and I still had all those pawn tickets. I just had this big old gangster wad of pawn tickets that I carried around in my And you know those mornings. You know those mornings where you're just sitting there going, Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, because I'd shot my wad on the insurance scam, and now I got nothing. I don't have any, and it's time to get everything out. You know, and I would have to go to my father, who was a good man, worked hard for his money, nobody was giving him his stuff, and I would have to go to him and say, Dad, if we act now, um, I can get you a pretty good deal on all of your stuff. You know, uh, but if we wait until tomorrow, it's going to be strictly retail, you know. And, and you know, are there, any, are there Al-Anons here tonight? How many Al-Anons are in the room? Welcome. I'm glad you're here. And believe me, we know that's not funny. I mean, you know, I have to say that like it's funny or I'll start crying. I should warn you in advance because I don't know what's going to happen later, but I'm a big guy, shoot, shot competitive shotguns and Harleys and all that stuff, but I'm liable to cry like a little girl in a pink dress up here at any minute, you know. So <laughs> don't be shocked by it. I'm okay, you know. But uh, but I couldn't tell that story if I didn't put a little, uh, you know, humor on it because the thing I remember was that we would have to get in the car, and this was in Dallas, and Dallas is a big town, man. I mean, this is, you're not just going to the pawn shop. It was like, we gotta go over on East Grand and get your deer rifle, and we go over on Buckner Boulevard and pick up the, the metal detectors, and your sterling silvers and garland, and we gotta go to Oak Cliff to get the shotgun and the coin, you know. And so it was all day in the car with me and my dad, and all that shame, you know. And as we'd be driving around, I'd be saying, Dad, I swear to God, I will never do this again. And if I was lying to that man, I darn sure didn't know it. But what I didn't know at that time was that I didn't have the power to make good on that promise. When I was promising him that I'll never do this again, I might as well have been promising him that I was going to flap my arms up here tonight and fly around the room and come back and land behind the podium because I didn't have the power to make good on that promise. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a hopeless state of mind and body. I had I had a thing that happened when I drank that made it me you know, So the way it winds up is I got, I got the mental obsession that develops after I'm sober for a while that makes me powerless over taking the first drink. And once I take the first drink, it triggers this phenomenon of craving, which makes me powerless over taking the second drink and the third drink. And what happens, the book talks about the terrible cycle. And the way that looks for a guy like me is when I really get going on this thing, I'm going to drink until I have to stop. And then I'm going to stop until I have to drink. And, I, and that's the terrible cycle we're talking about. And if you're caught in that or if you've been caught in that, you know as well as I do, there's a bottom below the bottom you know. I always say, don't ever say it can't get any worse. You know, all that shows is a lack of imagination. You know, because <laughs> what seems awful this year might look pretty peachy in a, in a few years. You know, so 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 that's my little thing on, on alcoholism. But the, and the, you know, and the thing we talk about when we talk about um, singleness of purpose. You know, I mean. On page 18, there's something that happens when you identify with another alcoholic. It was the first place I'd ever been around where, you know, people, you know, and I mean, there's people that already, tonight, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? The, the, your working registration when I came in? Dan? The, Gary. Well, I could tell Gary from 25 feet away, and I, and I was like, oh, I'd have drank with that guy. You know, I mean, that's that's like the highest compliment I can pay anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is you know, and I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, Katie and I'll be flying somewhere and, you know, and like I'm talking to Randy, I've never met Randy before, but they'll go, listen, I'm going to be standing at, in baggage claim and I'll look, and I go, wait, don't even tell me. Don't even tell me. I love to play this game. I love to come down the escalator and I swear to God, you come down the, the little escalator and you look around and you go, that's our boy right there. <laughs> you know, I mean, because... Because we, we sense each other on an energy level. I mean, on page 18 in our book, it says, But the ex-problem drinker who's found this solution, who's properly armed with the facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of a new man in a matter of hours. And the big thing about that is it says, Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That's why we talk about singleness of purpose in here. It's not that we're trying to keep the filthy dope fiend out of our rooms. 
um, if you're alcoholic and anything else, welcome. But we don't, I don't talk, you'll never hear any of my sponsors saying I'm an alcoholic and uh, anything because it doesn't matter. What we're identifying about in here is being alcoholics. If I go to another fellowship, I'll identify what's going on in that fellowship. But in here, saying I'm an alcoholic and a whatever, it'd be like saying I'm an alcoholic and a Texan or an alcoholic and a contractor or something like that. That's not what we're, you know, that, but that identification is so important that I don't know. I like to say a little piece about that because I didn't hear anything about that for a long time. I, um, well, what happened for me? Boy, I, and I, let's get this thing rolling. It's time for me to start getting sober. What happened was it got really, really sloppy there at the end. And, uh, and, and, you know, the pawn shop story is a wonderful example of how cool I was when I got here, how slick I was when I got here. I was, you know, that's, that's the guy that I brought to your fellowship was a guy that was a burden to his family and everybody that was unfortunate enough to love me. And what you guys have done with my life, I will be forever grateful for. What happened with me though, you know, and my story is, um, it's kind of, it's kind of different. You know, we talk about what it was like, what happened and what it's like now, what we were like, what happened and what we were like, are like now. For me, it's kind of like what we were like, what happened and then what happened and what we're like now. Because I, I um, what happened for me was I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and my story deals a whole lot with untreated alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because what happened for me, I came into AA and uh, I had a sponsor that I'll, I'll, I'll love till the day one of us dies, you know. It, it, you know, is that? But and we, Mark Houston used to like to say, "How do you know what you don't know?" You know, and th- that'll give you a brain cramp if you're not careful, you know. But but I mean, we were doing the best we could with the steps, and I went through an understanding of the steps, and I, w- I want to be sure and talk about this because what happened was. One of the biggest mistakes I see made in Alcoholics Anonymous, if there are any mistakes being made in Alcoholics Anonymous, and maybe there are, but this, you know, but what happened for me was I came in and we talked about being alcoholic. We didn't talk about physical allergy and mental obsession. We talked a whole lot about the areas of my life that are unmanageable and write down all the things in your life that are unmanageable. I don't read the book that way today. I may feel differently two years from now, but it seems to me that what it says in step one, if you if you read those first 43 pages in the doctor's opinion, it seems like what it's saying, the simple question it's asking in step one is, can you, or can, when we talk about unmanageability, is can you or can you not manage the decision to stop drinking? When I want to stop, can I quit entirely? Or if when I, you know, and that sort of thing. We get into broader scope of unmanageability later on, and, and I'm really looking forward. We're going to do a workshop tomorrow, and, and the, before I forget to say it, we're going to talk about what was the biggest change in the way my sobriety was in the first years and the way it's been the last nine years or ten years. And because what happened was, well, I mean, I, I'm, I got to tell you, I got serious ADD working up here. You know, I mean, my brain is liable to go off on bunny trails at any moment, you know, and, and there will be times in the talk where I'll say, we're going to get back to that later. And what that means is that this is not the proper time in the talk to introduce that little chunk of information. But I got to tell you, when I tell you we're going to come back to it later, we're probably not coming back to that. <laughs> I always get real excited when I actually circle back around to one, you know. But sometimes I'd be going along and I go, "Katie, what was I talking about?" You know. But but one of the things that happened was I, I came in and it basically was, a, "Are you alcoholic?" Yeah, and we talked a little bit about it, and then uh, and then all the th- and then it says. Are you willing to believe that there could be a power that can take you beyond where you are today? And if I said yes, we went right to the third step prayer. That was my experience in a, you know, in, in, in fact, we've seen, you know, after that A, B, and C, it says A, that we're alcoholic and could not manage our own lives, B, that probably no human power could re- relieve our alcoholism, and C, that God could and would if you're sought. And I got to apologize because normally around the country, that's where everybody chants like a bunch of high school kids at summer camp. I, it drives me out of my mind. You know that you know, they always God could and would if He were saw. Do, do they do that anywhere around here? Because you guys didn't do it at all. You don't have to do it. I, the thing I <laughs> the, the thing I was going to tell you is that the chanting in AA 
is it's not a it's optional it's come in through the treatment centers i love the treatment centers but they send us people and they, and if we're not here saying and you look like a jerk if you're the one going oh, sorry pal we don't we don't do that around here you know but i mean but for god's sake when i came in you know it, they would do the lord's prayer and they'd go keep coming back right and then it was keep coming back it works then it was, keep coming back. It works if you work it, and you're worth it. So work it. And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. You know, I mean, you know, I always, I always picture this poor new guy coming in going, geez, I want to stop drinking whiskey, but do I really have to do all this shave and a haircut two bits? You know, and, you know, all this, I mean. But I digress. Uh, you know, that's my. That's my little rant on chanting, but I, the, only, the only thing I'm saying is you don't have to do it. You know, in fact, you know, well, I'm not quite done yet. You know, it turns out amen is an awesome way to end a prayer. You know, I mean, we're the only fellowship that would take the Lord's Prayer and go, I think we can end it a little better than <laughs> Jesus did. You know, I, you know, it's a, you know, I'm just saying, you know, uh, but, oh boy, I better be careful. Uh, 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 what happened for me, though, in that C, it, it says, the next line says, being convinced, we're at step three. Right? Being convinced of what? A, B, and C. Well, this is what, a lot of what we're going to talk about tomorrow, but what happened for me was we went right from C, that God could and would if we were sought. If you agree with that, then he said, let's get down on our knees and do the third step prayer. And by doing that, we skipped this entire body of work that we're going to talk about tomorrow afternoon that it's really not that important. It's just the root of our problem and the basis of my sobriety for the rest of my life. You know, other than that, just go to 90 meetings in 90 days and you'll be, <laughs> you'll be fine. You know, but so I missed a lot, you know, and it says, and I didn't know it, but I wound up working a program based on the abstinence from alcohol. Right? And I was the guy that was in the meetings, you know, thinking, you know, I didn't drink. And you know that guy. I mean, I was the guy that was, you know, uh, left work, left for work an hour late this morning and screamed at my wife on the way out the door and slapped one of the kids and kicked the dog and burned out of the driveway and got to work and looked at two hours of internet porn and <laughs> left an hour and a half early and played some internet poker and got a half gallon of ice cream on the way home, but by God, I didn't drink today, and that makes me a winner, you know? You know? <laughs> You're like, no, uh, that kind of makes you a Nimrod, dude, you know what I mean? But better than when I was drinking, but I mean, I was, I didn't know I was doing this. There was never a time in my sobriety where I made a conscious decision to, to, to do middle-of-the-road sobriety. I just, I thought I was doing AA, and, and, and I was going to a lot of meetings, and I was very involved in the fellowship. But it turns out, it's mentioned in the book that I was in constant collision with something or somebody, even though my motives were good, you know. And it felt like I was killing myself out there trying to be sober. And, you know, and I hit the wall at four and a half years sober. And I hit the wall at seven years sober. And we're going to talk about it a lot more uh, tomorrow afternoon. But what happened was I didn't have anybody. T in my mind, I'm thinking, you know what? I've tried this deal your way. And I'm getting knocked to the mat every time I step into the ring. I'd blown up two relationships back to back, had two babies, two child support checks. Things were going ugly. To say I was in constant collision was an understatement. You know, I was overdrawn at the bank all the time, and 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 it was a little stressful. You know, I uh, um, you know, I, well, I could tell you some stories about that. But what happened was, at about seven years, I made a conscious decision to pull away from AA a little bit. I've been working a program based on rigorous honesty and all this stuff. And what happened, though, when I kept hitting the wall in sobriety, I didn't have anybody. I'm telling myself I'm running up against the failure of AA, right? I'm trying to, I didn't have anybody telling me, Charlie, you're not running up against the failure of AA. You're running up against the failure of self-will. This is what it looks like when you try to run the show yourself. Well, that's what we're going to talk about a whole lot tomorrow. And, uh, well... So what happened was, I go off into a, a relationship. Uh, I should point out that Katie and I were litter mates. We we sobered up just during near the same time. Essentially, can we say essentially the same time? I mean, you know, is five months really that big of a deal? 
you know, you know, she thinks so. But um, she'll tell you about it on Sunday. But but um, we were best friends for 20 years, and she was married the entire time I knew her. And I mean, we were literally like brother and kid sister. There was zero flirtation or sexual energy or anything like that. She was like my kid sister, and we were very, very, very close. And, and uh, well, but so I go off into. You know, I'd been in two marriages. I got married again. I'm, and now, Katie's not approving of any of these marriages. I mean, she's watching out there and just like, going, what are you doing? And you couldn't have stopped me with a chainsaw. You know, I mean, and I, I, I lose sight of what how prodigious self-will can be sometimes. I mean, you know, because I don't, I don't blame my problems on Jim or anybody. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not saying nobody was saying that stuff on pages 60 to 63, but if they were, I wasn't trying to hear it. You know, I'm sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am self-will run riot. Well, what happened was I go off into this marriage, and it's uh, I married a woman out of state. It was a commuting marriage, and she had an awful lot of money, and the lifestyle was really good, and we had a penthouse apartment in Manhattan and a beach house in the Hamptons, and, and a lot of this stuff was going on. We're traveling all over the world, and it was it was the most dishonest relationship I've ever been in. And I should point out to you, in case she ever hears the CD, that the most dishonest thing about that relationship is that I was in it. She was not at all getting the deal. You know, it's funny. When you start looking at that self-will stuff in, in 60 to 63, it's unbelievable. I mean, how it can rewrite history for me. I mean, my first marriage, if you'd have asked me 17 years ago or, or 50, you know, 20 years ago when I got that, if you'd asked me what happened to that marriage, I would have told you, She's cheated on me, and I don't roll like that, you know. And, I mean, that was the end of it and that sort of thing. And I would have believed it. But if you ask me today, given the current level of work we're doing and that sort of stuff that's happened since Mark Houston and what stuff I hope we get a chance to talk about, I would tell you there's a very good chance that I was exhibiting a level of selfishness and self-centeredness in that relationship that would have driven anybody out the door. It's a huge shift. But it happens as a result of this work. What happens was, I'm in this relationship, and one day, I'm, we're leaving the Hamptons, and I had some friends up, and we had chartered a plane to fly from Bridgehampton, from the East Hampton Airport out there into New York City, and uh, and we're going to go to dinner. Pretty civilized evening. Right? Now, 12 years of going out there, this is the first time I ever chartered a plane. I've been a gambler my whole life, right? I know about odds, but... We're flying out over the Peconic Bay, and I'm sitting in the in the in the passenger seat, and uh, you know, there's Shelter Island, and there's this, and all of a sudden we're, it's very very quiet, you know, and, and we're in a glider at about 3,000 feet above the water, and uh, and I put on the it was a charter plane, the pilot's right right here, and I put on the, the headphones, and what you don't want to hear your charter pilot ever saying is, come on, come on, come on, come on, you know, and he's he's jacking those controls, and and, uh, and they go, uh, they said, uh, you're cleared to Gabreski, and there was an airport right there at 10 o'clock, and, and he says, you don't understand, I've lost engine power, I can't make land, we're going to have to ditch, and I'm like, what? I mean, I'm a gambler. What are the odds of that? You know, the first time you ever charter a plane, we're going to put it in a drink. You know, <laughs> long story short, you know, he says brace for impact. You know, and you're like, does anybody know how to do that? You know, I mean, I, and, we, and we hit the water, and it's like six. It's nighttime. We hit the water. It's like. Splash down at six flags times a thousand. I mean, it's noise and spray, and the windshield comes in, and the cowling comes off, and and then absolute silence. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I think we're okay, right? I mean, we survived this deal. And right about that time, let me tell you, this wasn't much of an airplane, really awful boat, you know? I mean, <laughs> I mean, right about the time I'm thinking we we made it, I feel something on my knee, and it goes up like that and by the time I go up to get some air and I've tried the door and it won't come open and I go up to get some air and there's nothing but water and the roof of the plant and that's when I remember thinking so that's it so that's it I die in this stinking airplane today you know and I started jacking that door and it came open and we talk about selfishness and self-centeredness I can tell you when that door came open my first thought was I'm out I'm out 
you know, I'd like to tell you my first thought was my wife or my dog or the pilot or something like that. I pulled out, I got some air, I went back down and got the wife, went back down and got the dog. And long story short, out of five, there were five adults. The only non-survivor was our dog because the, the dog drowned in the plane. And, but we all got out. We actually revived the dog for a while, but he died two days later. But we were on Anderson Cooper, you know, live from the headlines with Anderson Cooper and all this stuff. And, and the reason I say all that is because something like that, when something like that happens, it can change the way you look at things. You know, it was a, it was a, and it's funny, I love to tell this story. I, we were at Crested Butte one year fishing and, uh, at the Crested Butte AA conference. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of like summer camp for AA. You know, you're there the whole week and you do all this kind of stuff. And we were fishing and, uh, I caught this monster trout, a little bitty hook, barbless hook about this big, and I can't, and I boat this guy, you know, and, uh, and the, the cat, the guy won't let us touch it, but he holds it up, and, uh, you know, we get to kind of have, take a picture with it and everything, and then we put it back in the river, and I always had a vision of that fish going back down to the bottom to his other fish buddies, you know, and going, oh my god, I was in the sun, you know, I, I saw the boat, you know, <laughs> I've, I've been returned back, he goes, I got to think I have a higher purpose, you know. I, I think I'm supposed to work with other fishes, you know. But, but I like to say that I was part of. I mean, it's no Earl Hightower story, but I, I like to say that I was I was part of God's catch and release program, you know. Because, uh, uh, but what happened was coming back, and I want I want to get a little further into this. What happened was. That's when we started hooking up with, with some other people. And, 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 I, and it started by going to John Henry. There was a guy there in Austin. I called him up one day and I said, John Henry, I, I'm so self-centered. I, I can't even be in a conversation with anybody. You know, I mean, I have to just force myself to go, how are the kids? You know, and act like I give a flip about the answer, you know, because I don't. I mean, I'm all about me. And, and, uh, and this is 17 years sober we're talking about here. I mean, I, I walked in the AA club one time and this guy goes, Hey, Charlie, how you doing? He goes, we need to go back to Las Vegas sometime. And I go, yeah. And I turned around. I was horrified. It took me two days to remember that I went on a Vegas trip with these guys. They were all sober. We're all over 10 years sober. But I, and when I got to thinking about it, the reason I didn't remember being in Vegas with this guy is because I wasn't in Vegas with this guy. I was in Vegas with me. You know, and me, and me, and me, and me, and how does this affect me, and what do you think about me? And, you know, and, 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 and this guy just happens to be along for the ride. You know, that's why, and that's the level of self-centeredness that I'm capable of carrying around in sobriety. I could tell you story after story after story. Turns out it's mentioned in our basic text, but I had missed it for a long time, and that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow afternoon. Well, we started doing some work, and, and, you know, John Henry started taking me out. We started going out to this treatment center on Mondays and talking to the guys. And next thing you know, I mean, they're asking me to sponsor them. And there were times where, I mean, it had it, it'd been a while since I'd sponsored a brand new guy. And now I could talk to you about living stuff. And I, I don't know who would have asked me for advice. But I, uh, but as far as taking a brand new guy and explaining to him the hopeless state of mind and body and being able to give him what we call the gift of desperation and get him inspired to go through the work, it wasn't happening, you know, and, and and I had to learn. There were times when I had to say, when I would tell a guy, go home and read the doctor's opinion and Bill's story, and I would go home and read the doctor's opinion and Bill's story. And there were times where I felt like I was a step ahead of these guys. And I will tell you this. I mean, I'm all about sponsoring guys, and I really believe in my soul that if a sponsor and a sponsee are both giving it their best shot, God takes up a lot of slack in a deal like that. Don't wait to sponsor somebody till you feel like you can do this deal perfectly. But it helps to read the book a little bit and, 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 and have had the experience yourself. What happened, though, was we started doing this work, and I started hanging out with a buddy of mine, a 12-step of buddy of mine that was taking 125 Vicodin a day, among other things. And we got him in treatment, and he met this guy with an eye patch that you guys are going to meet next year. And, and, uh, and he starts talking to him, and, and Chris was telling him, you know, about you know, what the true nature of alcoholism is and this sort of thing. And he got back up and that's how he got involved in primary purpose group in Dallas. And that's how we wound up starting a primary purpose group in Austin. And, and then next thing you know, Katie and I wound up at this, at this big book workshop with some guy named Mark H. Somebody had asked me about Mark H., about a big book workshop in Dallas. And I'm like, now here's how peculiar this is. You want to see the hand of God looking back on this thing. 
we wouldn't have been, even been terribly interested in going to a big book meeting, you know, because I like to share, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> But a big book weekend, for God's sake? You know, I mean, what? You know, oh, good, you know. Let's talk about the book all week, you know. Lit us on fire. We go up there. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> There's a guy sitting up there, and his name's Mark. And uh, to say that he spoke to us is a little bit of an understatement. There was a guy, and I mean, everything he said, I felt it right in here. I felt that connection like we were chained together. And he was saying stuff, and at one point, I leaned over to Katie, and I'm going, what book is he reading from? You know, I mean, I've, I've been around AA for 17 years. I've never heard some of the stuff that he's talking about. And I mean, this was clearly a dude that was taking this thing to a whole other level. You know, and I mean, we sat there in that workshop. Oh, my God. My... Mark changed their lives, you know, and the message that came through Mark, and Mark was never big. I mean, Mark did a lot of work for a lot of people. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to conferences and had people come up and go, Mark Houston changed my life, and I never met him. All I ever did was listen to CDs and that sort of thing. But even Mark was the first one to say, when I die, I think it'll be obvious to you. I hope it becomes obvious to you that all I've been doing is sitting on the riverbank handing out river water. You know, if, if something happens to me, just go right to the river, you know. And, but, wow, did he take us to another level. You know, and, and what happened was, as a result of all that, we started having a, you know, I started having a meeting on Thursday nights at the house with, with Mark and, and me and all my sponsees. And, and, and there was never one time that he walked into that house that I didn't know it was a big deal. You know, that this is something significant, that he's taking time out of his schedule to come spend an hour with us every Thursday night. And there were times where he'd just blow us out of the water. One night he called me on the way home. He goes, Charlie, i got to tell you something. I kind of feel like I'm running that meeting. I go, Mark, let me tell you something. You're running that meeting. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, <laughs> believe me, we need to hear what you're saying, you know. And, and so, you know, what happened was, but I mean, he talked about, when he talked about how do you know what you don't know, uh, we work, he started working with a lot of stuff and he sat down and he started talking about working, the, doing the amends process, you know, actually making all of our amends, becoming willing to make amends. To, you know, the first time he sat down, you know, that was the first thing he talked about. Cause you know, when you start working with a new guy, what's the first thing you want to do? When you want to go back through the work, first thing we want to do is write inventory, right? We're thinking we're all going to get together and write inventory. And, and he sits down there one night and he goes, what happened to your amends from the last inventory you wrote? And you're like, oh, um, I'm, I think they're in a drawer, um, you know, in my office, you know, because what happened was, you know, I was amazed before I was halfway through, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, and, and that list has a way of making its way into the drawer, you know, and, and that very first night he goes, I, I have a feeling that there's a significant experience available to you guys in the amends process. And we thought he was like Swahili or something. I mean, we're like, how does he know that? You know, and, and, and we started doing the work and we started, you know, really getting, oh my God, I'll never forget when, when the first workshop where he, he brought this guy, where he kept talking about the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and living within the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and discipline is the horse I ride. And when I'm practicing the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and, you know, Katie and I are out there going, la, 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 <laughs> please, please shut up. You know, because we're not even the neighborhood of the of the strict spiritual disciplines of 10, 11, 12. He, I got time for this story. He brings this guy up well, during that workshop. I'll never forget it. He brings this poor guy up, and he says, Paul, would you come up here and sit down? And the guy comes up to me and he goes, Paul, tell me. He says, uh, they both got microphones. He goes, tell me, Paul, do you meditate? And the guy goes, well, Mark C., he says, I'm a, I'm a truck driver. And uh, sometimes I meditate when I'm driving the truck and, you know, that sort of thing. And I'll think, and Mark goes, okay. He goes, a couple of things, Paul. First of all, when you're driving the truck, we really need for you to be about driving the truck. You know, I mean, we, we really don't need a guy hurtling down the road in a tractor trailer rig meditating. You know, and he goes, second of all, in the future, when I ask you a yes or no question, I'm going to expect a yes or no response. So I'm going to ask you again if you meditate, and it's important to me for you to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie and I are sitting there going, Woo, man, am I glad he didn't call me up there. You know, 
But I mean, Mark was like that. He used to say he was big on yes or no questions because he, he said, you know, you can ask an alcoholic if they're married and you get a five minute answer. You know, it's like that was a yes or no, you know. So, but, you know, what, so what happened? Um, we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff that I like to talk about a lot of time in step three. My biggest change in it, I had my biggest spiritual awakening at 17 years of sobriety. And a lot of it happened with a completely new understanding of step three. And I hope that some of you can come uh, tomorrow and talk about it, because we actually have time to talk about it at great length tomorrow. But, you know, what happened was when we started doing all this stuff on selfishness and self-centeredness, because what happens in my life is it's not a battle of, of am I going to drink or not drink. Now, that's there, and that's coming. That's a huge problem. But in sobriety... It's a struggle between self-will and God's will. Self-will and God's will. Consciousness of... I've, I really only got experience with two powers in my life. One is God and one is self. And it's which one is running the show today. And Because what happens for me in sobriety after a while is self-will starts rising up. God's will starts dropping down. And before I know it, God's will is off the table. God's not even a, a part of the equation, right? And, I, you know, and so what, the way that shows up for me, there's a, a, the 12 and 12 actually says we can have faith in God and keep him blocked out of our lives. And the way that shows up for a guy like me is I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah, man, God is awesome, right? I mean, God... Took away my drinking problem, I mean, God is the deal, you know. I mean, and, and I don't need him for this, you know. I don't need him for this thing with work, and I don't need him for this thing with my wife or my kids or my money. Or, but, I mean, if I ever get a really big problem, I'll bring God right in, you know. And, and, you know, and it's like in the meantime, I'm going, take a knee, God. I'll let you know when it's time for you to go in, you know. I don't know that's going on, and before long, God, you know, it got nothing to do with it. And you know, so I, one of the things we talk about a lot is if you want to see what I really believe, if I've made this deal in step three, don't listen to what comes out of my mouth. Watch my feet. That's how you'll be able to tell what I really believe. If I'm telling you I've made this deal with God in step three, where if I, He'll provide what I need if I stay close to Him and perform His work well, would you be able to tell that if He followed me around, right? Would you be able? Would you think here's a guy in a God-centered life? And now let me tell you, before we go any further, I am not nailing this deal perfectly. I mean, don't think that for a minute. In fact, I'll tell you a little story. I was, I was in. I went to give a sponsee a chip one night over at the treatment center on a Sunday night, and the next day I'm over at the Sprint store. Oh my God, has Sprint made some inventories in the past? You know, and uh, and I'm in there, and at one point. The one guy was going to help me, but the manager came in, and he's fouling the deal up. And at one point, I found myself up on my my knuckles on the counter yelling at this guy, you know, and he goes back in the back to fix my problem. And, and, I, and I stand back, you know, and I look over, and this guy is grinning at me kind of funny, you know, and I go, man, they get me a little worked up in here. And he goes, did you see me get my 90-day chip last night? Here I am, you know, Mr. 22 years sober, you know, and I go, listen, dude, um, what you just saw was not exactly our principles in action, you know, and if you stick around here for a couple of minutes, you'll get to see what an active tenth step looks like, you know, and, and that sort of thing. But, I mean, it's getting better all the time, you know, and, and you know, I don't know, I, I don't know what else. The thing that I worry about now are y'all familiar with the bedevilments on page 52 where it talks about we're having trouble with our personal relationship, we couldn't control our emotional nature, we were prey to misery and depression, couldn't make a living, had a feeling of uselessness, we were full of fear, we were unhappy, couldn't seem to be of real help to other people, was not a basic solution. Not just a little case-by-case -case solution, but a basic solution that picks all this stuff more important than seeing reels of lunar fly. What they're describing there is untreated alcoholism. But the problem is, I don't want to get too heavy into the idea of medication and that sort of thing, but untreated alcoholism can look an awful lot like depression. And I'm not saying nobody in the in the world needs to take pills. Believe me, I have to have a couple of cocktails before I start doctoring anybody. But... <laughs> Clearly, more people are taking it than need to be. And the thing I can promise you is if you walk into a psychiatrist's office and you describe the symptoms of the bedevilments on page 52, he's not going to say, 
what you need is a spiritual awakening. You know, he's going to say, open wide, you know, because, you know, you know, so the thing when I'm worried about in alcohol in, in my sobriety now is not drink, don't drink. It's, it's, I don't want to live in those bedevilments again. I'm scared to death to go back to living in the bedevilments in sobriety. You know, What we talk about is the second surrender in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? There's the first surrender. I know, I'm, I'm bringing it to a close. Right? There's the first surrender, which is the surrender to alcohol. And that's pretty easy, you know, because it comes off of having your butt kicked, right? I mean, but when you get here, it's pretty easy for me to calf up with alcohol and stuff because I've been whooped. The second surrender is the hardest one, and that surrender is the surrender to self-will. And... Boy, working your way up to that surrender is a booger. You know, I've always said being just on the other side of a surrender is an awful place to live. <sighs> I'm not exactly sure what all I want to talk about, but I will tell you this. We started working the steps at a new level of the work. We started getting involved with all three sides of the circle and triangle. Service, the fellowship the recovery program, doing all that stuff, working the steps. We're getting out with other people, working the steps. And all I can tell you is the change that it's made in our life, I would have never seen coming, right? I mean, I assume we're all Dallas Cowboy fans here. Uh, is that right? yeah. <laughs> I like to say that in areas where it really gets a rise out of people. But, but uh, you know, you say that in Philadelphia, it doesn't go well at all. But um, I've been a Dallas Cowboy fan since they were really good. You know, I mean, I, I I remember back when, you know, but the thing about it is, well, I've been going to all these cowboy games. One time I had a sponsee, and he goes, you know, my family's got a skybox at Texas Stadium. And I said, oh, good. And, you know, and one day he calls me up, and he goes, hey, do you want to go see the Eagles game in our skybox? And I said, yes, I do. And the thing is that I tell this is because what happens is we get in the car and we drive to a different entrance and we go into a little uh, quiet parking lot and we get to carry our own stuff in and we go in this quiet little entrance and you go up this nice quiet little escalator into a civilized little hallway and there's guys with trays of cookies and tubs of ice and and. and the thing I didn't know was I didn't know whether to be excited about being up in this skybox or whether to be pissed off about being in the cheap seats for 20 years. <laughs> that was exactly my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. If I had died in that plane crash, I would have missed everything. If you're new here, we love you. We're glad you're here. And we hope you keep coming back and become a part of our family. I think there's a lot of message of the hope of recovery out there for the new guy in sobriety, but I'm talking about the guy that's been around for a while, three years, five years, 15, 25, 30 years, and dying on the vine. If you're sitting in the room, there are, there's somebody in the room tonight that's not experiencing what you hear some people experience. And the way we look for them in the meetings, the way I look for untreated alcoholism in the meetings is I wait, and you know, and Katie taught me this, I don't want to steal it without giving her credit, is wait till somebody, you know how we all laugh it up in the AA meetings? Well, look around. That's your opportunity. Because when everybody's laughing, look around. Somebody ain't laughing. There's somebody in that room who doesn't think a darn thing is funny. That's the one I like to go up to and go, how long since you wrote inventory? Where are you at in the amends process? Are you sponsoring anybody? Do you practice the spiritual disciplines of steps 10 and 11? I almost missed it. If I died in that plane crash at 17 years sober, I would have missed the whole thing. If you'd have come to me when I had 17 years sober and said, Charlie, what is going to change your life and set you on fire is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous right out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have told you you're crazy because I've been in AA for 17 years. I know what AA offers me. I'd never stuck a toe in the water. There was an experience available that was so much bigger than anything I'd ever been involved in. I'm looking forward to talking to some people this weekend. The one thing I'll tell you, this is a program of action. Katie likes to say that a moment of clarity that's not followed by action is of no value. What happens is I'll come to these things, and I get around people that are in the solution. I get comforted knowing that the solution is out there. And what happens is, I, and, I, and by God, I think I need to do an inventory. I think I need to get with that annoying big book guy from my group and see if he'll take me this way. But what happens is I go home and I fall back into my life. I fall back into the kids, and I fall back into work, and I fall back into stuff before long. I really, you know, I really should be doing this stuff. 
if you're not experiencing what you hear people describing sometimes, I'm here to tell you it's still available. And it's available out of a very simple process right out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Get with somebody who's done this deal and say, show me what you did. We're, you know, the, you know, but I love any time we get involved in, in something like this. It is such an honor to get to come up here and talk to you people. We love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We love the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to wish you guys a, a wonderful conference and, and, uh, I look forward to speaking with anybody the rest of the weekend. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.